if for any reason you needed to virtually block out anything that could enter this hood, you could tie these straps to make it even tighter. The N3B Parka, worn during Operation Deep Freeze 1 and rated to negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit, is considered to be the warmest extreme cold parka ever created for the US military. It was later replaced with the extended cold weather clothing system. It took a lot of time and experiments in extreme cold weather jackets to get to this one. From the military using animal hides, to experimenting with fiberglass in a jacket, to rejecting the use of down and feathers in these extreme jackets, Screw that goose! The N3B was the first ever masterpiece in true all-weather military grade extreme cold clothing. Today, we are going through a brief history of extreme cold weather jackets, talking about the strengths and weaknesses of each one, and then bringing it all home and seeing how the N3B stole all the best features from each of them. We're also talking about a fabric that changed the world and caused riots and was supposedly made from dead bodies. Hello everyone, how do you do? What you are seeing before you is my N3B parka made by the Skyline Clothing Corporation in the year of 1970. Why 1970, you might be asking? Well, everything after that, I don't want to say it went poopy caca, because it, it didn't go poopy caca. But this era and before had a lot of goodies that modern N3Bs didn't have. Let's go over today's agenda. Number one is an overview of the US military racing to make the best extreme cold weather jacket that they could possibly make. Number two, zee woozy. There is a fabric out there that one was reported to be made from dead bodies when it first came out. Two, people were scared it was so strong that they would get stuck in it and die. Three, caused a 70,000 woman riot. Four, had songs sung about it. And five, there was a little Christmas little ditty sung about it when World War II ended because people were so excited that it was coming back. Number three, features of this jacket. Hint, hint, hint. Besides that, it's pretty bare bones besides some cool things in the pockets and this cigarette part. Okay, giving it away. <laughs> and finally, number four. According to who you ask and their perspective on materials, as this jacket iterated over time, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. That might not be true, depending on certain scenarios, but we'll be going over why it got worse and worse and worse. There's a big metal tube over there. Gotta inspect it and see what that's about. Before we get into the history of the United States extreme cold military jackets over time, I have to say there are a lot of variations. There's no way I'll cover them all. I'm also leaving off layering systems in general, just focusing on outer piece jackets. The greatest extreme cold weather jacket of all time, in my opinion, is the D1 mechanics jacket, but I'm also going to loop in the B3 and the B6, AKA big fat sheepskin jackets. While these were really great jackets, they were not perfect jackets. They had a lot of issues for people people that wore them when you consider all of the other materials that the US military could start implementing and could start using. They were perfect for the time, but as time moved on, not so good. Eddie Bauer, the B9 parka, and the Skyliner jacket essentially kicked off the down craze in the United States, and it hasn't stopped since World War II. People are obsessed with down, and really what happened was a lot of soldiers that were wearing the B9 parka while they were deployed were like, wow, this jacket is super warm, super comfortable, super light, and I don't have to worry about it. It's amazing. So essentially, most people were like, why would I ever go back to leather or wool or anything like that, except the US government. They were like, don't you see the problem, Edward? The fishtail parka goes under the name the M48, the M51, or the M65, depending on the year it was produced, and it started off as the X48, a parka filled with fiberglass insulation that had long fishtails at the end that could wrap around your legs to provide extra warmth. This is really where I think the US military was saying, what is the material that is not only going to keep soldiers warm, but also warm when it is wet outside? And the US military did this by experimenting with, I think, 11 or more different types of liners on the inside. But then, literally everything changed because of the popularity of a fabric that was introduced in 1938 by the DuPont Chemical Company. Nothing was the same. Huge jacket, wide pants. If I wore huge jacket, skinny pants, it would look like I could get toppled over. I would look like SpongeBob SquarePants. It'd be ridiculous. Having a well-proportioned fit is one of the most important things you can have with your fit. And that all starts with your pants. They're the great balancer. And that is why this video is sponsored by Huckberry and their 365 pants. Why are they called 365 pants? Well, with four very dialed in fits and uh, I don't know, maybe a trillion colors, you can wear the 365 pants 365 days a year. Are you surprised that that's why they're called that? Are you a straight fit pants guy? Huckberry's got your back. What about slim? What about tapered? What about the same jeans, but chino styled? Huckberry has you covered with the 365 pants. Get your pants fitting right and you'll notice that the rest of your outfit immediately falls perfectly into place. 
place. And the 365 pant is under $100. Super simple. You don't think about it. You just take it off, throw it on the floor, put it back on the next day. You still look like a billion trillion bucks. Style starts with fit and quality. And thanks to Huckberry, you could get both rather easily. Thank you, 365 Pant, for sponsoring this video. Over 3,000 five-star reviews. You just can't beat them. I highly recommend you check them out. In 1938, DuPont advertised a material that was as strong as steel and as soft as spider silk. They advertised it in 1938, and they didn't release it for two years after. But in those two years, the United States of America was essentially obsessed with this magical fabric that was coming to town. First off, after advertising and teasing this product for two years, DuPont released 30,000 stockings in Washington, D.C., and they sold out in less than three hours. Then, after that, President Roosevelt's cabinet said, this fiber has vast and interesting economic opportunities. Thanks, President Roosevelt's cabinet. That was fun. Then a news story came out that said, hey, Americans, you know that new miracle fiber that you love? Well, it uses cadaverine, which is from dead bodies. How do you like that? And the US population was like, that's insane. Are you serious? And DuPont was like, no, that's, we find that very yucky, actually. It's made from coal. This fiber that was introduced in 1938 that took America by storm by DuPont Company was nylon. Also, demo testing, I just want to show you this really quick. Demo testing, or, you know, test, oh, look, it's Taylor. So nylon hits the scene in 1940s and essentially breaks whatever the equivalent of the internet was back then, the telegraph, and people went nuts. It was dramatically stronger than cotton at the same weight, and it was cheaper to make, and if we look at DuPont's slogan, there was one more thing. If it's nylon, it's prettier, and oh, how fast it dries. Uh, DuPont couldn't make a ton of nylon, so we actually found two groups that were pitted against each other, fighting to see who could get their share of nylon. The first being people that wore stockings in the United States of America, and the second being the most powerful military force that the planet had ever seen. Believe it or not, the military won, and women that wore stockings couldn't get their stockings, which then led to the start of the nylon riots. 40,000 women in Pittsburgh and 30,000 women in New York lined up for only 13,000 pairs of stockings, which led to fights and obviously huge lines and angry people and everything like that, which caused people to write their congressmen to have DuPont licensed nylon production out. And then the government was like, no, you really have to do it. And they shared the licensing. That's nylon, baby. Okay, so before we bring everything home, because I do realize there's a lot of stuff up in the air right now, we have to go over the features of the N3B parka from least coolest to coolest. Number one, internal hidden storm cuffs. Number two, little ugly faux leather pocket reinforcements. Number three, big fat dump dump pockets. Number four is actually a very short zipper base. So that way you don't have to bend down because what could happen is if you get flanked by an enemy while you're zipping, prime spank number five true hand warmer pockets number six synthetic fur lined hood number eight coyote fur trimmed hood number nine not only do we have a spank proof zipper we also have a storm plaque under it to prevent wind and snow coming in but we also have a storm placket over it to extra prevent wind and snow coming in number 10 we'll talk about wool batting more in a second but all of the pockets are lined with wool batting number 11 this pocket on my arm which i use to advertise wallets but before that it was apparently used to hold cigarettes while you were out and about and if you really wanted to pens and pencils and finally number 12 there we go obviously this parka is famously called the snorkel parka and that is for the hood it is very snorkel like but we haven't even activated full snorkel mode yet here you can now see we have an absolute tunnel that is very very hard for wind and snow to enter keeping your face nice and warm and toasty we can go even tighter now to answer the question and bring it all home why did the N3B parka work? The biggest, most challenging thing was how do we keep soldiers or whoever's wearing this jacket warm when wet, but also make sure that what they're wearing isn't super waterlogged and heavy and terrible to wear. It dries fast and it's comfortable after it gets wet. So with that being said, the N3B was pulling more from the B3 and B6 than the B9, which was downfilled. Because while the B9 was warmer and lighter than the B3 and B6, and it had a hood, as you probably know, when down gets wet, especially down from the 1940s, it is essentially useless because it compresses and you're just left with cotton and squished down. When the B3 and B6 are made out of shearling, which even when wet does still insulate. But when those shearling jackets got wet, they got wet. 
and they stayed very wet and they were heavy and waterlogged and leather does a lot of weird things like dry and crack when it gets wet so it's not the best for wet conditions. So then we look at the B11 and fishtail parkas which got rid of the shearling outer and used wool padding on the inside so they took away the skin which was great because all of a sudden you had all the properties of wool without the downsides of leather being on the outside of it. But even then the B11 and the fishtail parkas were still having an issue and that issue was that they are still not drying fast enough. The outside of those jackets was cotton and when cotton comes in contact with water it absorbs it like crazy it sucks it right up which essentially means if your jacket gets wet and it's filled with wool it has an even harder time drying and ridding itself of all that water and all that extra weight which is no good so then we have nylon and this is where there's a really cool material dance with the n3 series in general you may have noticed in this video that i'm talking a lot about nylon and my parka doesn't look like it's made of nylon and that is because it's not totally made of nylon initially before the n3b there was the n3 there was also the n3a the n3 and the n3a and early n3b's were made of 100 percent nylon and they are very shiny they look like silk nylon as you know dries incredibly fast so i think that solved the u.s military's problem of how can we get this jacket to dry faster well if the outside dries very fast it gives what is in between the jacket a much easier time to dry so that wool padding also dried much much faster but why is mine in the 70s not nylon you may be asking I believe there are two reasons number one we introduced the blend it didn't have to be 100% cotton it didn't have to be 100% nylon it could be a blend of both so you get the best of both worlds you get the added breathability of cotton with the toughness and quick drying aspects of nylon genius the other thing though like i said when we were going over the features of this jacket is the fur on the inside of the hood is no longer mouton it is now synthetic and we started to introduce synthetic insulation instead of wool insulation which solves the outside problem now so we can go back to cotton because synthetic insulation allows you to make a warmer jacket because it's lighter than wool insulation and it dries faster so now we're not worried about the inside drying that fast so we can go back to a heavier cotton blend which is comfier for the person wearing it and then and that's the N3B. And I'm assuming the military also switched to a heavier blend of cotton because nylon and synthetic materials are just very bad around fire. You don't really want to be wearing a plastic bag if it's on fire for a multitude of reasons. You'd probably much rather be wearing cotton. So then the question is, why do some people feel like the new ones aren't as good? Synthetic materials over time compress, they lose their effectiveness, they don't look as pretty as time goes on. Not to say they aren't incredible jackets, but that's why. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you all very soon. I hope you're having a nice day or week or whatever it may be. Yeah, to TBH I would take this off because it is like 60 outside. This is not sweat, it's just very humid.